Good evening. To introduce the lesson for the evening, I'd like to ask you a question for your consideration. I'd like to ask you, when you think in terms of worship to God in the assembly, what comes into your mind? What's involved in worship? There are people today who seem to be confused about what, exactly what it is that Christians are supposed to do in worship to God. On the one hand, there are those who seem to want something new and something different all the time. On the other hand, there are those who seem to want to hold to only certain things and not even consider anything else. And uh, we're caught somewhat in the middle of that. There are, I suppose, the lunatic fringes on either side. I remember reading in the Dallas paper of a Unitarian church in Dallas who had a strip teaser and a belly dancer come because that was going to be her praise to God. That was going to be her part of their worship service. She did a belly dance as part of the worship of that church. Now, what's your reaction to that? you think that's somewhat extreme, or do you think, well, that's just using her talents? I remember years ago when I was a young boy reading about the, the one denomination in California that was going to bring Roy Rogers and Trigger to the church. Now, I don't know how they got Trigger in the church building, but they were going to get Trigger along with Roy Rogers and Dale Evans into the church building, and their worship was going to center around these Hollywood stars. And then I read of my brother who imported Fat Boone as the one who was going to be the center of the worship service. And he was participating as a song leader in the worship service. And many came because Pat Luke was going to be there. Not long ago in Arlington, there was an advertisement we got at Fort Worth of a young man calling himself Juggling Jeff. He could ride a unicycle and balance three balls at one time. And he was coming as his testimony in his ability as an athlete to praise Jesus. Well, you see all these things, and you say, is this really worship? Is this really worship? And that brings up the question of just exactly what worship is. And then we find people in the Church of Christ, where we have come, I believe, in our practice, where we have five acts of worship. And there are those who suggest that we are sick in the mud, and we're passed over any kind of change, and good because we're so stuck in the mud that we only don't allow five different acts of worship and some want those five acts of worship to be changed. So today there are those who advocate puppet shows and poetry readings and theater productions. And they want to branch out into various and some other kinds of things. And then the reaction to that is someone wants to be so secure in what we do that uh, they want to go to the other extreme. I know some in California, maybe even closer to home, that felt like we could not sing songs that were written by women. And so they went to the church building and tore out the pages of songs where women were the authors and pulled us out lest we violate letting women teach in the church. And you've got all these various things and problems. When Jesus Christ came into the world, he found that incorporated in the Jewish worship a lot of tradition. I'd like to invite you to turn to Matthew chapter 15, beginning reading with me with verse 1, where Jesus became what some would be called an iconoclast. An icon is an object of, rever of, of adoration, an object of worship. An iconoclast is someone who destroys idols, those idols of worship that are not orthodox. And Jesus has been called by some to be an iconoclast, or some of the demons who tore down the traditions. And we have people today in the Church of Christ who want to tear down the traditions. They want to tear down the idea of having five acts of worship and substitute other things. And the question comes up, should they be torn down? Maybe we ought to have more than five acts of worship. Maybe we ought to have five little different kind of things. Maybe we ought to have short readings or literature reviews. And those things. In Matthew chapter 15, the scribes and Pharisees who were from Jerusalem came to Jesus, saying, Why do your disciples transgress the tradition of the elders? For they do not wash their hands when they eat bread. Now you notice very carefully that the traditions of the elders were not part of the inspired record of God. But the traditions of the elders have been put down into a written form, and the traditions of the elders have through the centuries assumed 
as much importance to some people as the Lord God was, and some of the elders had just as readily quote from traditions as they had quote from Scripture. And when Jesus came not following the traditions of the fathers, they thought Jesus had sinned because he had not followed what they were used to doing. And Jesus replied to that, in verse 3 was, he answered and said to them, Why do you also transgress the commandment of God because of your tradition? For God commanded so. And then he went through some various illustrations of what he's trying to show. That traditions have come about in such a way that the traditions have been bound instead of the commandments of God. And he concluded in verse 8, verse 7 and 8, Hypocrites, well did Isaiah prophesy about you, saying, These people draw near to me with their mouth, and honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. In vain do they worship me, teaching as doctrines the commandments of men. If I understand at all what Jesus was saying here, it is possible to have vain, empty worship. And I don't want to be part of worship that God does not recognize. From the depth of my being tonight, I would like to think that Almighty God is at home in our sinfulness. I would like to think that when we have fellowship with one another and our worship services that we're doing, those things that God would prove of, and that if by some miracle the Apostle Paul could come back into the assemblies of the saints again, he would be at home among us as one who had the life of Christ, as one who had worshipped by the teachings of the Holy Spirit and knows what God would want. It's possible to see in our worship services those things that God will be pleased with. I have no desire to shock God. I have no desire to look for something new that pleases me if it's not authorized by the Word of God. At the same time, I don't want to be so wedded to traditions that I close my mind and get someone's suggestion about something that is spiritual that we might engage in that is not a violation of God's will. And I know that we do get involved in traditions. Years ago, there was a church in Fort Worth that decided to have a pictorial directory. And they had a company coming in to take pictures of all the members. And the preacher for the parish was in his office at the time, and one of the ladies came rushing in with tears in her eyes. For the parish, we have an instrument in the building. And she had heard sermons all her life about instrumental music being wrong. And she came rushing in his office with tears and distraught because we have an instrument in the building, and she referred to the camera that was being used to take the pictures of the members. And she could not see the difference between an instrument and the kind of instrument that had been condemned in the past with regard to instrumental music. And we get into the idea of traditions. We hear partly about the Word of God. We draw our own conclusions. And I know that we have our traditions about three songs of a prayer or two songs of a prayer. We go through these various things. And I understand that we're people who cannot get entirely away from traditions. But I believe we ought to be able to make a distinction between the things that we do to incorporate the worship in an orderly fashion and the faith of God that is revealed. I firmly believe that there's a pattern of New Testament worship that pleases God. And I say again that in our worship services, I will personally be involved in those things that I believe honors the name of God. I want to be personally involved in those things that I can incorporate my heart and soul and worship to God and believe that our petitions and our prayers and our worship ascend to the very throne of God. If God in heaven sees us, hears us, and accepts what we do. In John chapter 4, Jesus talked about the fact that God is a spirit, and those that worship him must worship him in the spirit and the truth, and such does God seek to be his worshipers. I recognize that God seeks men to worship him. He wants us to worship him. And I believe that we reach no higher plateau of fulfillment in our lives than when as children of God, not only individually as Christians, but together collectively when we come into the assemblies of the saints. That we join ourselves in fellowship one with another and lay our praise and adoration before the very feet of Almighty God as He sits upon His great throne in heaven. It's an honorable thing to worship God. And I never want to be in a situation whereby I would think that God would dishonor what I do. Or that God would say, that doesn't please me. And I know in various occasions, both in the Old and the New Testament, there are illustrations of individuals who have done what they wanted to do, and God has not received that worship. And so that suggests to me that God is not obligated to receive 
what I give him unless it pleases him. Under the Old Testament, there were those commandments of God to bring certain animals and sacrifice to God. And the Jews of that day were so stingy and so pecuniary with their things that they would pick out of the flock the sick, the weak, those about to die, and give those weak, sick things to God and sacrifice. They would save the best of the flock to them. In our terms, I guess it'd be like having a preacher over for supper, you know, lifting lift that chicken. A chicken is about ready to die. You go out in the field and you see this old chicken, he's just about to die. So, well, we'll feed this the preacher tonight. I wouldn't take that very kindly, and I don't think God takes very kindly. He said he didn't take very kindly. He said, when you have a governor to come see you, would you give the governor the kind of sacrifices, or, the, or would you give him the weak animals that you give me? And he said, you despise me by what you do. You despise me. And I don't want anything that I do to suggest in any way that I despise God. I'm not to give God the best. I've always preached and taught in my life that the search for a Christian is the search for excellence. <coughs> I believe as the song leaders have done, I think the song leaders ought to lead the song the very best way they have. And I commend the brethren for your song leader. I'll be the Bible class teachers ought to give to God and your Bible class teaching the very best that you can give. I believe that when you make a contribution from your income, you do the very best that you can do to serve to God. And that has true across the board in all that we do. Everything we do will be the very best because I'm giving it to God. I hate the picnic atmosphere that is crept into churches where, where we seem to sort of bring to God uh, the attitude I've been out on a picnic and I'm going to suddenly stop that and give that to God. And I believe we'll give God the very best that we have. I'm not suggesting we have to have a cold and a tie to always serve God. But I am saying that it's an attitude of heart that all the way we try to give God the best that we can. Let's make the application to the idea of worship. Exactly what is it that God wants us to do in our worship? First of all, whatever it is that we do, we ought to give God the very best that we can. I don't believe in giving God the leftovers. I don't believe in God giving God the scraps of our time, the scraps of anything. When it comes down to God's part of my life, it ought to be the top, most part. I've always thought, for example, like elders. I don't think you can simply take elders and qualify them and make them be elders. I believe that when men are going to give their life to God and when a church is full of men who want to be the very best kind of men they can be, as cream rises to the top on milk, the best men who are qualified to be elders will be known by the members because they're giving to God the best of God. And when you have men who are not serving God in the past that they ought to be, from the heart, first of all, you'll never have elders. You can't just make elders because you want elders. You've got to have men who give God the best of God. That's true God worship. So what is it that we're supposed to give in God worship? Just exactly what we're supposed to do. Somebody comes back and says, well, you can't read anywhere in the Bible about five acts of worship in the church. You just can't read about that. Why do you come up with five? Why don't you have six? Why don't you have four? Where is it written in graven and stole that you've got to have five acts of worship? The purpose of this lesson tonight, I know that in the handout that was given to you, when I did this, asked me for the lesson titles, I put five acts of worship, but I put a question mark after on purpose. And the reason why I did that is because of all the people, they were questioning five acts of worship. Why not six? Why not four? Why not three? Why not ten? Is juggling Jeff? Maybe number seven. Is the woman who does the strip tease or the bed dance? Is that number eight? I mean, who are we to sit back and say that here's a woman who loves the Lord, she can't do a bed dance to please the Lord? Do we have a right to criticize somebody because they do these things? Or did God deliver to us what he wants us to do? In the Corinthian letter, when we begin studying 1 Corinthians, almost always the first thing we do is all the problems for the and it's very true that the church at Corinth is filled with problems. <coughs> what many times we don't do is recognize that the problems of the Christian church were answered. And when you look at the inspired testimony of the Apostle Paul and begin to recognize that he wrote to the church because of their problems and gave to them the answers, the thing to do is to recognize that when you strip away the problems and get down to the bedrock of the truth that was supplied to that church, they have what God wanted them to be. 
I believe that New Testament Christianity was exactly what God wanted it to be. Now, not the abuses, not the problems. The human element crept into the church at Corinth. When the church at Corinth was established by the preaching of the gospel through the mouth of the Apostle Paul, the result of that church was exactly what God wanted it to be. Now, jealousy crept in. Division crept in. Men calling themselves after the name of men crept in, and problems began to arise. But when those problems were corrected and brought back to the bedrock of what the gospel ordained them to be when they were established, you have the New Testament church exactly the way that God wanted it to be. Now, when I want to belong to the New Testament church, I have no interest in belonging to a denomination. I have no interest in furthering the cause of a denomination started by men. I don't belong to the church that the Apostle Paul belonged to. I don't belong to the church that the New Testament Christians belong to and serve God in such a way so that if any of those Christians could see us today, they would say, well, that's just the way we worship God back when I was alive on earth. Now, then, can I identify the New Testament worship from the pages of the New Testament? And can I find what we call corporate worship, that is, the worship of the church? So that we can identify the items of worship that the New Testament church incorporated in their symptoms. I believe it can. I believe it's in the book of Corinthians. Let me say that there's nothing that I'm going to say tonight that would speak against private worship. I believe that you can go in your homes and your closet and pray. I believe you can sit down with your children and take a song book and pray and sing in your homes. And that you can do good deeds in various ways in your community and all kinds of things that you can do. So far as private worship is concerned, and I'm not talking tonight about private worship. I'm talking about those things we do as a corporate sense when we come together. I know there are brethren who decry there's no such thing as a corporate assembly. I just believe there is. In the New Testament, there are churches of Jesus Christ, Romans 16, 16, and plural. You can't have plural churches of Christ without singular churches of Christ and the church of Corinth. In chapter 1, verse 1, it's called the church of God at Corinth. If you want to call it the church that belongs to God, or the church that belongs to Christ, I won't, I won't quibble about that because either one is scriptural designation. And I believe that there are atoms in which we come together and in our corporate assemblies as a local church, we engage in public worship and I will defend the idea of a public worship service in the church. I read about them in the New Testament. But now what did the church of Corinth do with worship? I believe that we can look at the at the New Testament. Let's turn to 1 Corinthians chapter, uh, first of all, let's begin with chapter 11. I will begin with chapter 11, go through some chapters with you, to show you that in the New Testament worship, under the guidance of the Apostle Paul, you had literally five identifiable acts of worship that the brethren in the public assemblies participate in. And that those are things that you find that we can do today, that God is pleased with, and that when you get through with these, you will be exhausted the list. I do not believe there are six things that the church did in public worship. Now, if you can find number six, then you bring it to my attention. I don't ever want to preach there. And if you'll find something other than these five that the church did in public worship as a corporate body of people, that I'll engage in that with you. For example, in Jesus' time, with regard to the apostles, they washed feet. Jesus washed the feet of the disciples at the time the Last Supper was given, instituted. But foot washing was never part of the New Testament work as worship. The New Testament church never washed feet as a worship service. In North Carolina, when we lived out there, there was an occasion when the Free Will Baptist Church would ask all the visitors to leave. And they would have a worship service of foot washing. You can't find that in New Testament. What was there as far as the worship of the church was concerned, the foot washing Jesus did was done prior to the establishment of the church. It was never set into the church by the apostles as an act of corporate worship by the church. So when you start looking for something, and you can find six or seven or ten or whatever, you can find those, I'm willing to do it. Whatever it is that God wants us to do, we want to do that. In 1 Corinthians chapter 11, you have some things set forth, first of all, that is with regard to what the church did. Look at verse 18 in the beginning. Paul said, for first of all, when you come together as a church, 
So here's an assembly coming together. I maintain that's an assembly practice. Here's the corporate church work, that is the congregation coming together. It's not private worship. It's not individual, just sort of loosely coming together. You've got the church of God at Corinth coming together as a church, and they're going to worship God. Now, the problem that was at Corinth was that they had corrupted the Lord's Supper. The problem about the Lord's Supper was it had been so corrupted that some came in and had a gluttonous feast with it. And some have been suggested that they were drunken. And that some say, well, that's a gluttonous thing. It's not necessarily drinking alcoholic beverages, but... What do you view it as alcoholic beverages or what it's gluttony? The whole idea was that the Lord's Supper had been totally corrupted. And the Apostle Paul was saying, you can't eat the Lord's Supper the way you're doing it. So whatever the abuses were, let's take those out. When you get back to, when you get rid of all the abuses, you get rid of all this gluttony, you get rid of all the jealousy, you get rid of all the disdain one from another, and looking down on one member as opposed to another member. You get rid of all the problems. You get back again, what did God want the church to call us to do? All right, we have that given to us. Verse 23. For I received from the Lord, <clears throat> that which also I delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the same night in which he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, Take, eat, this is my body which is broken for you. This do in remembrance of me. In the same manner, he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. This do as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death in the darkness. Therefore, whoever eats this bread or drinks this cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty of the body and the blood of the Lord. But let a man examine himself, and so let him eat of that bread and drink of that cup. Here then is getting back to the bedrock truth of what God wanted that church to do. It was an act of worship for God. Here's number one. After that, you can have Matthew chapter 26. In Matthew's account of the Lord's Supper. You can add to that Acts chapter 20, verse 7, where it was the practice of the disciples on the first day of the week to come together and work away. And you can look <clears throat> throughout the New Testament at all that the Bible says about it, but here you have a case of an assembly of the saints coming together in a worship service, and they take the Lord's Supper. That's number one. And I believe from that that I have a right to come together in the assembly with other saints on the Lord's Day and eat the Lord's Supper in the way that God prescribed. And that I'm not doing anything in violation of the will of God. But if I fail to do it, I'm failing to do what God wants me to do. Jesus said this do. This do in memory of me. And I'm obligated to do that. So in my worship service then, from a free heart, we set aside the time of the Lord's Supper on the Lord's Day. And we eat the supper. We take it just exactly like the first century church did. Unleavened bread and fruit of the vine. We know that the unleavened bread represents the body. And the food of the vine represents the blood. Now, the body was given for me, the blood was shed for me on the cross of Calvary. And I know that when I participate in that, I'm having a communion with Christ and a fellowship with my brethren, and I'm worshiping God. So that's one thing that I would be very firm in, that I, my conscience would hurt me if I violated that and did not take the Lord's Son. But then going further, we also notice there was something else with regard to that church. And I want to notice that still in the assembly, just talking about the assembly, in chapter 12, we have now talking about uh, various things that are gifts of the Spirit. Now, the gifts of the Spirit are named there. There are nine of them. I'm going to talk about tonight a study of the Holy Spirit, those gifts of the Spirit. But notice that the gifts of the Spirit included the idea of teaching in the assemblies. And uh, uh, that uh, you have miraculous aspects of it because the Holy Spirit was there. And even in the use of the miraculous gift, there were those who had jealousy and envy and strife. And some was covetous of what they thought was a greater gift than another. And in chapter 12, Paul has to set them straight. He has to remove the problems. The problems were the misuse of the spiritual gifts. But when you show in chapter 13 of the Corinthian letter that the spiritual gifts were going to be taken away, and at the time when the spiritual gifts were to be removed or taken away, and the full revelation of truth came, then you understand that Paul was still talking about something that can be new to me today, not in the last aspect of teaching, but in the teaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ. In the church of Corinth, they had something that could not be duplicated today, 
They have the miraculous Holy Spirit gifts that we do not have today. Now that's another subject. We can't talk about that tonight. I would defend how to go back there no way. But when you remove the abuses of the Holy Spirit, when you remove the jealousy, you still have the idea there very clearly that they were prophesying, they were teaching, they were edifying the church and the worship services because they taught one another. Now look at chapter 14, because chapter 14 deals also with that same idea of prophesying and what prophesying is for. In chapter 14, verse 12, Paul says, Even so, since you are zealous for spiritual gifts, let it be for the edification of the church that you seek to excel. So we're talking about now something for the church. The assembly is still under consideration after chapter 12, chapter 11, 12, and 13, and 14. And we notice down in verse 28, uh, verse 28 says, But if there be is no interpreter, let him keep silent in church in the assembly, and let him speak to himself to God. So here's Paul taking an abuse now out of this business. There were those who would, who would speak without having the right to speak, and there were all kinds of abuses. But Paul's taking the abuses out and saying, that edification is for the church. Edification is to build up the body of Christ. And he says, let all things be done unto edify. In chapter 14, verse 1. Pursue love and desire of spiritual gifts, but especially that you may prophesy. For he who speaks in the tongue does not speak to men but to God. For no one understands him, however in the spirit he speaks mysteries. But he who prophesies speaks edification and exhortation and comfort to men. He who speaks in the tongue edifies himself, but who prophesies edifies the church. So clearly what Paul's got under consideration here with regard to the teaching is under consideration is the fact that he's going to edify the church and the teaching is a part of the worship of the New Testament church. So though there are no spiritual gifts today, and though we're not to be jealous of one another, then we're to properly exercise care in how teaching is to be done so that we use all the talents of all that we can Teaching is part of what the New Testament church did in the time of Paul. And he wanted that teaching to continue because prophesying was to build up the church and make it stronger. You can't have a strong church without teaching. It's impossible to have a strong church without having good teaching. So part of that worship service, here's number two. In the New Testament church, in Carlin, when they came together, they had instruction from the Word of God as part of their worship service. And I maintain that we can do the same thing. Now, in the same context, in chapter 11, verse 19, we also have, with regard to this, some things with regard to uh, the, the business of praying. They prayed in their sins. In chapter 11, and verse 19, Paul said, uh, but oh, there must also be factions among you. Look, look at verse 18. For first of all, when you come together as a church, I hear there are divisions among you, and in part, I believe it. For there must also be factions among you that those who are approved who may be recognized among you. So even though there are troubles in the church, factions and all these things that go along, the idea that in the church there is also that which can be right. And that's what we're seeking after. That's what we're trying to find in the church, that, thing, that which is right. Now come back to chapter 14 again. And he talks about this business of praying. Praying. Again, in the matter of praying, they have spiritual gifts. But if you take away the age of spiritual gifts, and you take away the problems of people who prayed when others didn't know what they were praying about, you still have prayer as a part of the worship life of the assemblies of the saints. Verse 14 says, For if I pray in a tongue, my spirit prays, but my understanding is unfruitful. What is the result then? I will pray with the Spirit. I will also pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit, and I will also sing with the understanding. And so they prayed all of it in the assembly, and we're told very clearly, down in verse uh, 16, look at verse 16, otherwise, if you don't pray with the Spirit and the understanding, otherwise, if you bless with the Spirit, how will he who occupies the place of the uninformed say amen at your giving of thanks, since he does not understand what you say? And so when someone prayed, there was somebody else standing off out here who was listening. And when you got through leading in the prayer, there would be those who would say, Amen. So be it. That is, I agree with this prayer. That's what we do here. Because that's out of number three in our worship. We can find the New Testament church come together in an assembly arrangement. When you remove the spiritual gifts aspect of it, 
when you remove the abused aspects of it, some who would pray in such a way that they could not be understood, some who would pray in such a way that they did not edify, you still remove all that, you said, I'd rather be praying to God. Those who listened and said amen at the prayer because they understood it and agreed because they prayed to God. That's what we do here. And I maintain that if the Apostle Paul should, should somehow come into our assembly, or if Jesus Christ in heaven hears our assemblies, and I believe that he does, he would think that we're doing now in our assemblies just what Paul did under um, the guidance of the Apostle Paul. Prayer is a part of the worship of our saints. In that same order then, and I can go into many parts of the Bible and talk about prayer. I'm not going to do that. I don't have time to talk about prayer as an individual worship thing. The Bible discusses prayer on many occasions and tells us about it. I want to show and impress upon you that the New Testament church worshiped God in prayer. Now we also notice in chapter 14 and verse 15 that they sang together. He said, I will pray with the Spirit. I will pray with the understanding. I will sing with the Spirit. And I will sing with the understanding. New Testament patients will sing these people. Now I don't know exactly what Paul their song took in every essence, but I do know from Ephesians 5 and verse 19 that when they sang, they sang in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. And I know from what the Bible tells us about that, that they were singing and not making uh, an instrument in the use, uh, not using an instrument in the use, because in all the New Testament, every time singing is under consideration, it is always singing and not singing in play. They didn't use instruments in the New Testament worship, but they sang. In Colossians chapter 3 and verse 16, it adds to the information that we have on singing. Ephesians 5, 19 adds to it. The book of James talks about singing. The book of Hebrews talks about singing. All the places in the New Testament talks about singing. The New Testament church sang. They were singing people. You know, sometimes at home we have, in fact, regularly at home, we have the fifth Wednesday night of every quarter. We have the singing. And just as surely as we announce that we're going to have a singing on Wednesday night, some brethren won't come. And that always disturbs me because we're going to be singing in heaven. And I don't know where they're going to go. They're going to wait for our singing when we get to heaven. I just don't know what they're going to do. It worries me when Christians don't sing and somebody says, Well, I can't carry a tune in the bucket. God didn't ask you to carry a tune in the bucket. Like someone said back in Joel Floyd. We can sing with the spirit and the understanding. I may be all key. I've been all key a lot of times. I've been all key my But God knows my heart. And I'm going to sing to God because singing is part of worship to God and there's going to be a time, I pray God there will be, when we get to heaven together and we're going to be before the great platform of God. And you talk about your heart and verse, I think if you couldn't burst out a song before the great platform of God. If you couldn't worship God in heaven without singing, I don't think you could even be in heaven. How is it possible to come together in the assembly of the saints and not think in terms of music? We sing together because it's an expression of the heart. We sing the spirit. We sing the understanding. Well, that's what the New Testament church did. That's how we perform. They sang. And see, I'm not making these up. I'm not creating some kind of artificial list. I'm going to the Bible looking what the Bible says that the New Testament church did under the direction of the inspired apostle Paul as he got rid of the problems and taught them what God wanted them to do. And the other thing that's listed is number five is in 1 Corinthians chapter 16 where the Apostle Paul speaks with the guard of their collection. And uh, by the way, he said, well, that's a collection of act of worship. Yeah, I think it is. But the Bible teaches that it is. I know somebody can say, well, giving to God is not an act of worship. Well, I think it would be possible to do a word study on what the word worship means. And the idea of the Old Testament Go back to the Old Testament and forgiving of the people of their animals. Go back and look at the people regarding the tithes. And how God regarded those tithes. And how God regarded those old men that chickens. And sick animals that God, that the Jews gave. Acts of all that he gave to them. The point is that they gave their sick animals. And God knew that he was, he was despised for those people. Because they didn't give him what? They could at the very best. And when we come together in our assemblies and reach into our pockets and give to God a portion of that which He's blessed us with in a financial way. Second Corinthians chapter 8 and 9 deals at length with attitudes and that, and God loves a cheerful giver. 
And now that I recognize that what I give to God is just like seed, and that God is going to give me back so much more so I can begin to outdo God, and don't ever think you can outdo God and do good. If you give to God the things that belong to God, you're going to have some blessings. I'm not talking about financial blessings. It's health and wealth doctrine. The TV preacher said, if you'll send me 10% of everything you've got, I guarantee you that God's going to give you this 10 times what you send me. I'll be looking at you. I'll be going to be rationed out by somebody who doesn't give doesn't get a 10% return or 100% return on their money after those arguments have been made, I believe they'll be sued. First of all, it's not God. Say, did you ever notice that when these TV preachers talk about sending money to God, it's always their address that it is? People out there made a mockery of worship, a mockery of God. Now, I'm not going to stop preaching that giving is an act of worship because somebody out here abuses giving. I know somebody says, well, now you're preaching on giving. Churches always preach on giving. Yeah, churches preach on giving if they preach the truth because God wants us to understand. You know, God doesn't need my, my money. The psalmist said that God has the cows on a thousand years. You bet God needs my little puny dollar. What God needs from me is my sense of dependence on Him and my sense of gratitude to God for what He's done for me. When I make up my contribution check, that's what I'm saying to God. God, I need you. And I thank you for what you've given me. And I'm giving you this back to part in your service of what you've given me. And I do that as an act of worship to God. I do not give my money to the church. I give my money to Christ. Sometimes there are people who say, well, I'll, I'll start giving when the church has more need. You missed the point. Church is always going to have need. It's an active church, and a Christian church. But I don't give my money to the church. Everybody says, "Well, if I give my money to the church, maybe I don't really use right." Well, that's what the Bible called. We ought to use it in a scriptural way. The point is, though, we need to learn that what I'm doing in my giving, I'm giving to God. Now, that you and you alone, between you and God, you determine whether or not you're being stingy. You determine how you're going to give to God. You can let your conscience be clear. When you spend more on incidentals than you give to God, then that's what you know. But rather, it's an act of worship. And you're letting God know how much you think about Him. Because this is what this is all about. How much is my worship to God? When it comes down to uh, various things, I don't want my life to be considered by God that I just let give Him that focus. Death of the years, I've used the illustration of a brother that I'm part of. When I was in college, there was a brother who laughed at me and told me one time. That when he went to church on Sunday morning, he took the money he was going to go out and have lunch with and put it in one pocket. And he took his contribution and put it in his other pocket. And when he got to the church building, he forgot which was which, and he took the money that he was going to go to lunch with and put that in the collection plate. And when he went down to the cafeteria to have lunch, he didn't have enough money to eat. And he thought that was so funny. And I thought it was a sad commentary. He wouldn't give to God what he spent on one meal in his contribution. Now, if you want to go to God and face him for the fact that he gave Jesus Christ down the cross, and I'm so stingy that I'm not going to give him enough that I spend on one meal in my contribution for a week, you go face God like that. I don't need to. I've been blessed more than that. And when I give to God, what I give to God is because I worship him. And I praise him in my giving. And when I put that money in the contribution plate, it's an act of, it's a gift to God. That's what I feel about it. When I sing to God, I'm singing to his throne, his glory, his praise. When I pray to God, I'm speaking to God, I'm praying to God. And when I give my money, I'm giving my money to God. Now, over five, actually, I haven't just made those up. They did this come out of the blue. Those are things that I find in a New Testament church in every instance in an assembly arrangement where they came together and served God and worshipped God. And I believe that that's exactly what the Bible teaches that we ought to do. And I defend that. I stand right here that there are five scriptural acts of worship that are identifiable that the New Testament teaches that that's what they did and that pleased God taking the abuses away 
And that we ought to take the abuses away and get back to the bedrock of truth and serve God those five acts of worship. Now, if you find number six, then you should. I just would not dignify bed as an act of worship to God. And I would not dignify riding a unicycle and balancing three or four balls or ten balls as a juggling act as worship to God. Brethren, I think we have to give account to God when we treat him with disrespect. And when we just laughingly throw in all this sort of thing that God has to ask for, and I disregard the very things that God has asked for. I think we'll have to give an answer to God for it. On the other hand, whatever it is that you feel in your service to God that you want to praise and adore Him, you can find the avenues in these five things. And I challenge anybody to find an attitude or an emotion or a feeling or anything else that pleases God that you cannot find in the use of these five things in service to God. And you can give the sum total of all that you are and of all that you feel in service to God by these five acts. And when you get through, you know that's what God is. Now, the point is worship. This is what it is for me. I believe I can find in the New Testament scriptural worship. The New Testament kind of worship. If you're not a member of the body of Jesus Christ tonight, you're going to wander out in the religious world. You're going to find all kinds of things. Every kind of imaginative thing that can be imagined is going to be done. From the strip station, the bed adventures, up or down, whichever way you want to go, you're going to find those things. But if you want to find scriptural New Testament worship, you find a church that's worshiping God after the order of New Testament. And you worship God, and God will be pleased. You pray as tonight and not a Christian. We invite you to consider just as worship is important, so also is the plan of salvation. The plan of salvation is not something that is human to be devised. The plan of salvation is from the Word of God. The great commission is he that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. Mark 16, 15, 16. I don't know whether you think about it or not, but I do. I think about the fact that it's such an honorable thing for me to stand before you tonight and preach the same message that Jesus said to preach in the great commission. I won't all for it one day. Take away from it, not at all. Add to it, not at all. I will preach the same message that the Apostle Peter preached in Acts chapter 2. I will take away from it or add to it. It's a great honor tonight to say to you that you need to obey the gospel of Jesus Christ by believing in Jesus, repenting of your sins, and being baptized for the remission of your sins, because that's what Acts chapter 2 does. And this church will not add to or take away from the gospel message, but we preach exactly the old Jerusalem gospel, the New Testament gospel invitation. And that is that when you believe in Jesus Christ and turn in penitence of every sin, and you confess with your tongue that Jesus Christ is Lord, and are baptized upon the uh, confession of your faith in Jesus Christ, your sins are washed away in the blood of Christ, and God saves you, He adds you to His church, and then as a Christian, you engage in worship to Him as a corporate body of people together and privately in your good life. If you're the only one here tonight that's not a Christian, and you want to be involved in worshiping God and serving God, we invite you now to the front all together. We sing. Thank you, God.